a very terrible thing happened to my family in 1948. My father developed, developed a brain tumor and died. He supported the family and now I was the only boy in the family. There were four sisters. So the various friends and families that we knew well said, Howard, now you are the only boy in the family. You, you understand that you become their breadwinner. You've got to work and earn money so your family can survive. He was a hard worker. He was a bright fellow. I hope some of that wore off on me. Uh, he worked long hours, and he was a kind man, good man, and when I was young, he would give me 10 cents to go to the drugstore, and he called it 10 sticks, and that was 10 pieces of candy at one cent each. My father was Grant Steve Clark. My grandfather uh, was the head of the bank at the time, and uh, he worked in the bank for over 100 years. Well, put it, change it, over 80 years, until he was over 100 years old. In fact, he was in the bank at 102 years old, working when he was taken to the hospital for merely a checkup by one of his grandsons who was a doctor just for a checkup and uh, he was a proud man and he fell over the side of the bed when he got up to go to the bathroom and that ended his life. He rode his bike to the bank every day uh, when he was until he was about 98 years old, and then he walked to the bank. And one day, my mother was out taking care of him for a few days, and she noticed a big stone on the side of the front door. And every day he'd left, it would be gone, and when he was back home, it was there. So she asked him, what's the stone for? And he said, well, I notice I list a little to the left when I walk to work. So if I put this stone in my right hand, it keeps me going straight to the bank. Um, our, the Davis County Bank Correspondent Bank, where they kept the major part of their money, was First Security Bank in Salt Lake City. Uh, and he'd get on the bus or he would drive in. Uh, often he'd get on the bus, go to Salt Lake City, and drop the money off. And uh, one day, the bank driver, or the bus driver came back to the bank and said, I think uh, they used to call him the bishop because he was an LDS bishop for 27 years. Uh, I think the bishop has left his lunch on the bus. The bag of money was thousands and thousands of dollars, not his lunch at all, and he'd taken it into town to deposit it and uh, left it on the bus. <laughs> Often he'd go to town in his car to deposit the money, uh, and then he'd take the bus home because he forgot that he'd gone in on the car, with his car, and he left it in the park in Salt Lake City. The concept of me being the breadwinner sunk in to me, so I really thought I was really going to help. But my mother was the breadwinner. My mother started playing the piano at four years old, practicing four hours a day. Her father had a good ear for music, and he would listen. He would put ten beans on the left side of a keyboard. Every time it was played perfectly, he'd move a bean to the right side of the keyboard. If there were eight beans on the right side and she missed, all ten beans 
would go to the left side of the keyboard to start over again. It wasn't until she played it 10 times perfect that she was through after four hours with playing the piano. They had a Fourth of July parade in American Fork where they lived, and there was no parade for my mother until she played her assignment 10 times perfect. She later, her father was a polygamist, was in the LDS times of polygamy. And uh, he worked in a, in a store, a dry goods store, but not at a lot of money. And they needed more money. So my mother helped to earn money by going to Provo six days a week and playing in the silent movies. She'd play the piano to the movie. She'd interpret the movie and, in, and accordingly she would play. As an example, one fellow who had been there the night before came to her the next night, the night she was playing the same movie again, and said, oh dear, I, I, I came the second night to hear you play that piece again. I loved it. It was so fabulous. But you didn't play it again. Well, that's because she made it up. Every time she saw the movie, it was different according to if the horses were running, the piano was running. To some extent, but in order for my mother to make a living at a standard of living she wanted us to be at, uh, the piano was just not available to me. And so people asked me, well, why didn't you play the piano? Well, the piano was not available because she would teach after school from four o'clock until 10, 11 o'clock at night, all day Saturday. Not so much on Sunday because we'd go to church and that was a more of a family day. But she did that uh, in her life, during her lifetime. And when she got the age to go to the university, she went to the BYU and she was given immediately a studio and she was on the staff of piano teachers as a freshman at the BYU. She continued to do the silent movies, so she'd have enough money for her apartment and her living expenses at the BYU and able to send some back to her family in American Fork. Uh, one of her students, oh, she was the, the designated accompanist for all of BYU. One of her students, going back a long way, is still now the designated accompanist for the BYU. I, uh, I hope in the work I've done over the years and in the various businesses I've started and have all been successful, thank you, um, there's been originality like she could sit down and compose music beautifully, and that takes an original a mind to accomplish that. Some of the work I did was somewhat creative when I was really young, in grade school. I'd get picked up by an open by a truck. The rules weren't that, you know, you couldn't sit on just a flatbed truck and I would go to an area just north of Lagoon where the Utah State University had an experimental farm and at a very young age they gave me one acre to maintain and they planted it with experimental vegetables, flowers, various things and I was to take care of it and harvest it. So I had to get the right fertilizer, I had to get the right amount of water, I had to watch those plants day in and day out to make sure they were growing properly and the Utah State University would have the production out of the plant that they were looking for. And they were experimenting, giving me different fertilizers and different things to see how different plants would react. That was in grade school. Originally, uh, and I went there for one year. 
and that was in Bountiful, Furious. It's a South Davis Junior High School in Bountiful, Utah. And you went there for one year? I went there for one year. Well, then my four sisters were at the University of Utah. And, excuse me, correction, three sisters were at the University of Utah. And my one sister, Norma, had not finished high school. So when we moved, I moved uh, to the uh, junior high, and she moved to the high school. She moved to senior year of high school. That was very hard on her, but Norma was a pretty beautiful girl and charismatic, and she there in one year was very popular and won a queen spot or whatever. I went to junior high in the Salt Lake City School District. They had what they called the AU, Articulating Unit, which was crazy, but they did. And that meant that you when it took the seventh and eighth together. So you only went to junior high school two years instead of three years. Well, when I moved to Salt Lake, I moved when I'd be in the seventh or the ninth grade because I'd missed the articulating unit from the start. And so I had to choose seventh or ninth. And with some counsel, seventh grade, seventh grade go back to seventh grade, which I'd always already finished to go to the ninth grade because there was no eighth grade oh, in the school. And with some counseling with the teachers and so forth I'd had in the seventh grade, they decided that I would go to the ninth grade. So I didn't go to the eighth grade at all. I went to uh, the ninth. It wasn't that I was exceptional. All of the kids missed the eighth grade. I missed it a little bit differently than they did. I just jumped seven to nine where they went seven and eight. I was 13 years old. I needed to earn some money. I thought, how can I do this? It was coming up the 4th of July. I knew the kids would want to do fireworks. We didn't have control in those days like they do now, which is so controlled. Um, I ordered a fireworks catalog from China because I knew that's where they made most of the fireworks. And my interest was in um, a firework called the cherry bomb that most of us know. They're very powerful, just a little ball, and has uh, one fuse coming out of it. And so I started ordering uh, cherry bombs. Well, of course, I was buying them very inexpensively from China, and I was turning around, probably doing an illegal thing, but there wasn't all the control there is now, and I was selling them. I was, everybody wanted to buy cherry bombs, not just the kids, but the kids' dads and brothers and all, and I had a ready market. I mean, that was duck soup. I just doubled the price of what I paid for it, and uh, I made money. It was, it was a good business. And so that was your first business? That was business? my first real business, yes, and I was 13 years old. 